Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 173 of your favourite Formula 1 show. Yes, Knowing Wheel returns this weekend to look back over the action from the Miami Grand Prix. And actually a decent Miami Grand Prix in the end. Yes, I think, I think we were all a little bit apprehensive as we moved into this weekend. Something else we're all a little bit apprehensive of is bringing on my co-host every week for the show. <laughs> it's Jamie183. Well, we've How done it 172 we times before, so hopefully we're okay at it by now. But I'm doing well. Yes, uh, actually a, a good race. I was saying before the show, it's probably quite easily the best weekend of the season so far. So that's good. We're, F1 is back, and no, I'm not going to go that far. But yeah, it was nice to uh, to come out of a race weekend feeling good about the sport. Yeah, it was it was finally seemed like a bit of a high point so far on what's kind of felt I wouldn't quite say a damp squib of a season, but certainly uh, a little bit mediocre in places. Of course, before we get into that though, obviously we've got to ask the big questions. Jamie announced obviously last week he was at a wedding on Monday, hence why the podcast is going out slightly late. Where are you uh, going with this? Did <laughs> you get absolutely fruit pastled? <laughs> I did not. Uh, that is a no, shame. the 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 wine and a prosecco was very good. But wine I didn't and go prosecco. Support. White wine. Sorry, and was, prosecco, was, yeah. it, was it a wedding or was it a Hindu you went on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a beer drinker, so if you ever meet me in public, buy me a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. If you see me at the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix in a couple of weeks, uh, yeah, make sure to bring him a G and T, yeah. otherwise he won't speak to you. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, moving into the weekend, though, obviously, we, we had a few little bits of news, didn't we? Kimi Antonelli, apparently Mercedes or Williams were looking to try and see if they can get him an FIA super license. And then now they've both said they're not getting him an FIA super license. But mm. apparently still it is being looked into as to whether he can get an FIA super license. Yes. Yeah, there was a document or like a press release came out that somebody somewhere has requested the FIA to give Kimi Antonelli some special, like the Max Verstappen rule, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so somebody wants him to drive, and it'd be strange if it wasn't the team he drives for, uh, or the team he's a youth driver for, anyway. Um, so, but then both James Vowles and Toto Wolf have fully denied it, haven't they? Uh, that he's he's not looking to drive. Uh, they haven't asked for special dispensation, so the earliest he could drive would be Monza when he turns eighteen. Um, because, yeah, if he was a driver before then, he'd be 17, which you can't do without the special dispensation. So, yeah, it's. I don't think there's any smoke without fire, uh, but I'd be surprised if he's in before Monza, to be honest. I mean, James Fowles kind of was a little bit you know, we're not saying it's happening, but we're also not saying it's not happening. Uh, apparently, Williams yeah. are in talks with six different drivers at the moment as to a potential replacement to Logan Sargent, which, I mean, for Logan, you've got to feel. Unless he just starts beating Albon every single week, which I don't think any of us see happening, he basically is kind of aware now that he's losing his seat at the end of the year, isn't he? Which is probably yeah. quite a horrible position to be in, or worse than that, maybe losing his seat before the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, but I think we saw that last year where it it's the team's intention to keep him as long as he hits his targets. And if he's not hitting his targets, then you can't really have any complaints, can you? Um, so, yeah. I I think it's yeah. tough on him, but that's how the sport is, really. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because unless his target's Kevin Magnussen, then he's, he's struggling to hit a lot of things at the moment, I would have thought. <laughs> um, obviously, we'll Very talk good. about that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, the other one that was quite interesting, though, is there's rumours that Valtteri Bottas could be heading to Williams, returning to Williams, even, wow. I should say. Uh, after I, 10 yeah. years away. He's very frustrated with, with Sauber right now, obviously, with similar rumours that they're going for science, and obviously they've got Hulkenberg already, so he could be on his way out of that team. And if he is, he obviously needs to find a new seat. So, yeah. Uh, and he's frustrated because they changed his engineer, like, on the day of the first... This, this Yeah, this was going to be one of the first points I was going to make yeah. when we got into free practice. He, he arrived in Miami... Uh, and apparently it was Audi's side of management basically rocked up to him and went, this is Steve, he's your new engineer this weekend, enjoy. And Bottas was yeah. kind of like, right, okay, great. Uh, and it, it didn't end up going particularly well, did it? As we'll mention in sprint qualifying no. in just a moment. But, I mean, obviously we're, we're seeing Hulkenberg go back to a team he was at in 2013. Um, we're going to see Bottas go back to a team he was at in 2013. Um, Vettel to Red sorry, Bull. Just, yeah. 
Uh, Vettel back to Red Bull. Uh, Hamilton will stay at Mercedes. I guess he's the only driver that's still where he was. Fernando to Ferrari. Could be interesting. Yeah. Leclerc back to go karts. Oscar Piastri back to the womb. Um, a lot, a lot going Pretty on. Much. Um, which I mean, could could you end up in a scenario for Bottas where he's kind of there, like, well, they want to bring Sainz in next year. I don't really care what happens now. Could he end up going back to Williams before the end of the year? I mean, it's not out of the question. It seems like that that Salva team is a bit dysfunctional right now, so. You know, if he wants to quit, he could probably year. quit. Yeah. Yeah, it's very frustrating as a Joe fan that not only can he not show how good he is. Uh, is that because he's not yeah. particularly? <laughs> he beat his teammate in every session this weekend. So, yeah, but you know. Bottas just had another weekend where he did nanked, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. Which is a bit of a So, shame. yeah. Um, it's not a fun team to be a part of, I presume, right now. Yeah, I think it's just a very much kind of all eyes on the future, isn't it? And they kind of aren't really worried about where they are at the moment. Uh, speaking of, though, Bottas, as we just mentioned there, of course, the drama pretty much kicked off immediately, didn't it, in sprint qualifying, uh, because due to his new race engineer, and I believe his new race engineer has exactly zero experience in Formula 1, uh, he almost completely cleaned out Piastri, uh, basically yeah. at the start of the weekend. Yes, he yeah, into Turn 1, he just had no idea that Piastri was right behind him and turned in as if he wasn't there. Uh, so that was a good start. I don't, did he get a penalty for that? I think he, he, he did. He didn't, because there was no contact. Ah, well. Or, or uh, he that's... might have got a penalty, but it made no difference. Yeah, um, potentially that. Because I think, the order. yeah, it was absolutely blocking. So you feel that's quite inconsistent if he didn't. But then the stewards love a bit of inconsistency. So as we'll get on to later. <laughs> we will, we will. Um, but I mean, yeah, sprint qualifying one, it was kind of like some of the usual suspects, wasn't it? Gasly, Joe, Bottas, Sargent and Albon. Uh, all out there. Logan Sargent, though, shout out, we were just saying about how he's going to get dropped for the first time ever <laughs> in a Formula 1 qualifying or sprint qualifying session. Uh, he did actually out-qualify Alex Albon, mainly because he ruined both of his laps. Yes, Albon didn't get a re- like representative time on the board, so Sargent beat him by qualifying P19. Get in. We love to see it. We love to see it. Um, moving, though, through into sprint qualifying 2, obviously McLaren had brought a huge host of upgrades to the weekend, hadn't they? And they were seriously looking like they were working quite well. Norris was able to fire up the medium tyres and, again, was fastest on the board. Uh, the same couldn't be said, though, for one of the other Mercedes-powered teams. In fact, the Mercedes team, mm. uh, because their drivers were both out in Sprint Q2. Yes, and it very, very poor uh, for them because, yeah, they looked a bit faster than Aston most of the weekend. But to go out, you know, they were the fit, not only the fifth fastest team, they're also behind three of the midfield teams, right? Or just two? Uh, As in, they were behind a, yeah. uh, an Alpha Tauri and a Haas. So... Yeah, it was it was not a good look for Mercedes to be so slow on the mediums uh, in sprint quality. And in the race, they didn't really come back through. They, everyone kind of thought, oh, they'll be the ones to watch. And if anything, they went backwards. In the sprint race, yeah, they were. Yeah. It, it, see, Mercedes were really. Mercedes and Aston Martin are really odd. Because I think we can both safely agree they're kind of like the worst of the top teams mm. at the moment. It seems like Aston Martin can immediately chuck out a decent enough package but are then sort of more susceptible to dropping back in towards that back marker group when things aren't working. Mercedes it seems like it takes them way longer to get the car set up in a way that works so they're kind yeah. of more susceptible to dropping back behind behind some of those midfield cars early on in a weekend. Yeah definitely and we saw that in, in Friday qualifying. Um, and then yeah Q3 everyone's kind of hopeful because I think there was six cars that were all pretty much on par for the fastest yeah, time in Q2. Ferrari, Red Bull and McLaren all looked good, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. And then what happened in Q3? Absolutely everyone just failed and that left by default, if anything else. Max Verstappen took sprint pole and then said lol on the radio, which I absolutely love. <laughs> he was so bemused as to how everyone fell off because his lap was terrible. Uh, but was good enough for pole position, so can't complain. No, it was one of those weird ones, wasn't it? I mean, it was kind of a theme throughout the weekend that tires, soft, soft compound tyres simply could not last an entire lap 
in sprint qualifying or real qualifying for that matter which we'll get mm. onto in a bit um so kind of everyone messed up their laps so i would say the one exception to that uh, was probably actually daniel ricardo p4 yeah in that Al- oh sorry in that v carb car on the grid that was a monumental performance by a driver that we've been incredibly critical of so far this season mm, but very very good uh in the sprint quality and yeah p4 it was like basically everyone everyone messed up especially norris who qualified ninth uh after being on for pole in q2 um and yeah ricardo was just there to take advantage so fair play so he was definitely one to watch in the uh, sprint race he certainly was and moving on then into the sprint race uh it, it was drama immediately wasn't it um yeah max obviously had to, as he always does defend super aggressively uh, from Charles Leclerc whenever he starts alongside him. One day, I just want to see Leclerc turn him uh, when he does well, something like that's, that. Well, that's how Seb destroyed his championship in 2017, wasn't it? By doing something similar and not allowing for a third car in the picture. So exactly. one day, the the car in the second row would get a better start and take them all out. So Let's, let's keep our fingers yeah. crossed. Um, <laughs> but the real drama, yeah, was really down at turn, wasn't it? Which There's quite a lot to dis- dissect here. Um, mm. But it's safe to say Lewis Hamilton was feeling brave. Yes, yes, feeling very aggressive. Uh, but even before he tried to bowling ball everyone out of the race, the two Astons had already made contact. Yes. So I don't want to pin it all on Lewis. No, exactly. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't look very good on Lewis Hamilton. Uh, but yeah, Alonso. I actually. I. <clears throat> I. I want to triple check this. I'm convinced it was Alonso into Stroll, but all it the was. commentators were saying it was Stroll into Alonso, but I don't think it was. So, um, Stroll was already starting to turn in because he had a car on his outside, and Alonso yeah. wasn't turning yet. You could make the statement that Stroll turned in on Fernando, um, but I think the problem is still, I mean, it's something we've spoken about so much. Fernando Alonso is kind of treated as a god. Fernando Alonso <laughs> can do no wrong in a lot of people's eyes. And everyone's saying that, oh, we'd spotted Lewis down on the inside there. There was another car between them. I think it was Hulkenberg. Yeah, it was Hulk. So he I'm not just, really yeah. sure how Alonso could see Lewis particularly well. And let's not forget, Formula One mirrors are useless. Like, yeah. they're basically just there Especially for aesthetic purposes. lap one, turn one, you're not looking in your mirrors, I'm not going to lie. Not like, much, yeah. Until, no. <laughs> yeah, when he, I think Stroll Alonso maybe would have got away with it if Hamilton hadn't barged his way in two. But there were certainly contacts before Hamilton arrived on the scene. They were and already yeah, that was, having a crash. It was four into one, and Hamilton dived ridiculously late. It looked really poor from his point of view. I was amazed he didn't get a penalty. Uh, I don't know about you, but... I was also yeah. quite staggered, to be honest. The uh, the upshot was that Hamilton into Alonso, into Stroll, into Lando Norris, who found himself on the outside, and that was his race done. Uh, so out at turn one Stroll also got bad enough damage to retire and Alonso's race was ruined and Hamilton carried on uh, but his race was ruined for another reason so yeah yeah so obviously safety car was immediately called out and for whatever reason Lewis just decided he was going to so they basically obviously because it was a crash at turn one and the pit lane re-emerges through turn two Often what they'll do to try and clear debris is obviously get everyone to drive down the pit lane behind the safety car. Uh, Lewis just decided he didn't need a pit lane speed limiter, which is a very odd yeah. choice. Uh, but he was done, I think it was 17 kilometers an hour over, yeah. which is quite a big mistake. Uh, and that basically meant, although we didn't realize it at the time, uh, his sprint race was ruined. Um, and I, I think we've got to give a special shout out as well, um, because Fernando Alonso, after the race, tried to claim the FIA is racist. <laughs> which is probably a little bit of a rock and a hard place because he can't blame Lance Stroll because his dad owns the team. <laughs> I'm not sure racism is the best alternative to claim. No. Alonso's always been the victim when it comes to the FAA, doesn't it? So it doesn't surprise or he me. Thinks even he back has in, been. Even back in two thousand and six he was always like the FAA favour the Germans over the Spanish. So <laughs> I yeah. It's it's not a it's not news really is it? It's just Alonso. I mean, but um, I think my problem is you know throwing around flippant remarks like that. And I mean, of course, you know we we can talk about social media and things like that. But there is stories more years than not of Spanish fans showing up to the Grand Prix literally in blackface and things yeah. like that. You know, it, 
it's one of those things that it still feels like it's a little bit kind of more socially accepted in Spain. I mean, we had that thing a couple of years ago, didn't we? With Carlos Sainz's dad promoting a go-kart track with somebody mm. blackface. It's... Yeah. I mean, obviously, neither of us are Spanish. Neither of us spend much time at all in Spain. I'm sure, actually, you do. I don't um, spend loads of time in Spain. <laughs> but it's it, been at it, least uh, of... at least eighteen months. <laughs> Fair enough. It it does certainly feel like one of those things, doesn't it? Where it's at least from the outside, it still feels like Spain. Gen- I mean, you see it in football as well, don't you? Spain still yeah. inherently has quite a systematic problem with racism. It's a lot more sort of culturally accepted still. Not to say the UK is perfect by any means. I mean, obviously, we've seen all of the racists come out of the woodworks whenever we've got any kind of election uh, going on yep. in this country. Shout outs to Count Binface beating uh, Britain <laughs> first. That was incredible. Um, but I, I, I struggle. I mean, again, I understand, obviously, when a lot of people say, oh, you know, there's British bias in the media and things like that. But when you're reading British articles that are independent companies and publishers and things like that who are trying to make money generally speaking they're going to try and steer towards something that a British audience is going to want to read and that's either something that's kind of hyping up the Brits or still claiming that Lewis Hamilton doesn't pay tax <laughs> yeah media is all about clicks at the end of the day and exactly. interaction so they're going to they're going to publish stuff that is of interest to their audience regardless if it's good interest or bad interest so you know, if you don't think the media is biased, then get your mind out the, the uh, get your head out of the sand. Exactly, and I mean, I, I also, <laughs> I mean, I, I've experienced this firsthand. I don't remember if I can't, don't know if you'll remember this, Jamie. But at the end of last year, you know, when um, the dr- overtake of the year came through, mm. and it, it ended up winning was Fernando's switchback on Lewis in Bahrain, which admittedly, yeah, was a good overtake. It was a good overtake. But it beat out, I think it was Magnussen on Sargent at Monaco, which was an insanely yeah. risky dive bomb that only Magnussen would attempt. <laughs> and I basically put out saying, if Magnussen had done what he did to... If Magnussen and Alonso had swapped situations there, yeah. Alonso at Monaco would have absolutely yeah. won. And it ended well, it's a up popularity contest, it, isn't it? E- exactly. It ended up making it into Spanish media and things like that. Really? And yeah, no, they were like sp- Spanish media is a bit strange. It's like Spanish meme pages, to be fair. Okay. I I didn't mm. realize it at the time. That's why the tweet went uh, like you know viral as such, like in the F one space. Um, yeah. But yeah, I never knew it. Kind of made it onto a load of Spanish media pages. The amount of racist comments I got. On that one tweet from Spaniards <laughs> trying to claim I was the worst human being ever to have lived was genuinely staggering. Well, I'm glad you can take it. I, uh, I could yeah. care less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Spanish are quite something. I also realised that I said 18 months when less than a year ago we did a podcast in Spain. So that was true. That was not we true. We did, so. didn't we? I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in Spain, lads. <laughs> Oh man! Right. Oh man! Uh, anyway, Let's so back back to the sprint race. We've gone down the rabbit hole there, and every Spanish viewer has now clicked yep, off. Goodbye, goodbye, <laughs> little fellows. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, the rest of the sprint race though was fairly dramatic. Uh, Max just walked away. He he took the win. No spoil. Uh, no real surprises there. Sorry. Uh, Perez had a good little move on Daniel Ricciardo because all the moves were really coming down. Not the back straight, but the back wiggly straight that isn't technically the back straight, wasn't it? Because there was a yeah headwind. into the low, into the low speed section. I actually think the design of that section of track is pretty good because basically, if you get the inside line, you can hold the position quite easily because the inside of the following corner basically makes it out like impossible to go on the outside. Um, which means, yeah, it, it, it's quite a good track design because you have to go for the risky move on the inside of the of the, the big braking zone. I think it's turn eleven or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it means that the outside line, it actually makes it quite hard to overtake there, despite being a big braking zone. Um, but that made it a good race because you had Ricardo in a, in a V-carb able to hold off a Ferrari and a McLaren. Uh, not easily, but, you know, the battle was good, which I think is what we want. So, yeah, Ricardo was able to cling on the whole race to P4, which was very, very impressive. And he also had another slower car ahead of a faster car, Kevin Magnussen. Uh, doing his best Saudi Arabia impression and uh, protecting Nico Hockenberg in P7 by just racking up every penalty under the sun. Which again uh, in is... His... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to make it... I'm going to reference back to Fernando Alonso. 
Do you remember when he cut the chicane last year and everyone threw him a parade? Because, oh, it's incredible <laughs> strategy. Yeah. A lot so, so smart. When Magnuson does it, everyone wants his head to be taken off. Yeah. I did feel a little bit for Magnuson by the end of the weekend because there were some incidents that I don't think he would have got a penalty for if it wasn't Kevin Magnuson. Well, we'll so, talk about that in a bit if yeah. we're thinking of the same incident. Um, but these ones absolutely were his fault, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, uh, he so was he on could... one. <laughs> yeah, very, I very think funny. Maybe he's trying to get a contract for next year. <laughs> Pos- I mean, well, he's doing honest, everything he can for the team, isn't he? Basically, exactly. Hulk, to be fair, is basically obviously with Hulk gone, it's probably made Magnuson's contract opportunities a lot easier. Because it's basically just going to be Magnus and a Bearman next year, isn't it? Probably. We, we kind probably, of already yeah. know that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, he was cutting the chicane to try and build up a gap. He was trying to switch back Lewis. He was rejoining the road from off the circuit. Lewis, obviously, once he knew he had a penalty, couldn't care less. And I think was just there for a laugh and just enjoying the battle. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, it, but it did mean Magnuson got, like, six different penalties, didn't it? Um, yes. By the My end, favourite by the one was when, when Lewis was on the outside of turn 11 into the breaking zone. Lewis broke as late as you might possibly want to. Oh, yeah. And Magnuson didn't even think about the corner. It was just like, I'm going to watch when he breaks and then break a bit later. Exactly. <laughs> and then they both just went sailing straight on. It was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's, but, it's just the Max yeah. Verstappen rule, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've spoken about this so many times before, but Formula One has bent over backwards to try and make the way Max Verstappen races acceptable. And we've, <laughs> we've said it, it has ruined the sport. It's messed up battles quite a lot because they're just it's just very easy to just be not very respectful and kind of get away with it although Magnuson didn't get away with it this time thankfully um because he's Kevin Magnuson but yeah it was very very amusing as a non-Hamilton fan because Magnuson was just barging off the road everywhere and Hulkenberg was just sailing off into the distance and secured his two points so well, it, was, was it was amusing as a Hamilton fan as well because yeah to be fair, this, this season's down the drain I don't. Yeah. I don't think Lewis cares. I don't think anyone else really cares. Um, it's just going to be. Let's see what Ferrari do, and hopefully they're cooking for next yeah. year. Although, should Lewis have gone back to McLaren, all will be revealed <laughs> later on. I don't think uh, that's an yeah. option too. I'd rather have Norris and Piastri. I think. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, no, you'd you'd always take Lewis for the marketing. I, I think people underestimate still just how powerful he is. Um, but yeah, it was a max victory ahead of Leclerc. Uh, Perez, Ricardo P4 in the end, uh, beating out Sainz, Piastri, Hulk, and Yuki Sonoda picked up the final point by virtue of both Hamilton and Magnussen's penalties. Uh, moving on, though, into main qualifying, there was a little bit of mix-up, wasn't there? Probably the most notable one was that Ricardo completely fluffed it. Yes. Uh, yeah, after qualifying P4 on Friday, uh I think he came across some traffic, didn't he, in the final sector? Uh, so that was his lap, his final lap in qualifying ruined. And he qualified P18, 19. Yes. And 18. he had a three place or a five place penalty from overtaking under safety car in China. So he was last. Uh, so <laughs> looked unlikely to repeat his P4 in the real Grand Prix. When we said earlier there. on that we'd been putting Ricardo under a lot of pressure so far this season. The Ricardo pressure is back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it had left for 20 minutes. Um, and yeah. it is a bit odd, isn't it? The fact that Sonoda seems to be able to do a better job most of the time. But when it comes to having like that one big result, it seems to be Ricardo that can kind of pull it out. It's a shame he saved it for a sprint race where there's next to no points available. Yeah. Um, but, but it is still true. Yes. Uh, I've just I was trying to work out how many penalties Magnuson got just briefly. He got three ten second time penalties. Yeah. For leaving but he the track didn't get and some penalty advantage. points for some of them. He got a five second time penalty for exceeding track limits. And then in the real race, which we'll get on to, he got a ten second time penalty for causing a collision and a twenty second time penalty for entering the pits and not changing tires. What's that which about? I don't get how that works. He gave himself a drive through penalty, really, didn't he? But exactly. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, who knows? Very, <laughs> very odd. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, real qualifying, though, like I said, it was, it was kind of a similar story to um, Friday qualifying, wasn't it? Of, I mean, you had all the back markers, well, Alpha, uh, Stake out in Q1, Joe Guanyu, uh, back row of the grid. Uh, shout outs to him. Sergeant <laughs> Ricardo Magnus and joining him and Bottas as well. 
Uh, Q2, everyone was really disliking their tyres. It was actually both Aston Martins that went out this time mm. um, with the Alpines. Uh, they're finally down to the correct weight as well this season, so that's why they yeah, gained a little bit of performance. Up. Um, and of course, obviously, yeah, did scale, score their first point of the year. Um, but yes, Lance Stroll like, qualified Fernando Alonso. So all of you claiming that Fernando Alonso is the greatest human ever to live. Uh, even Lance Stroll can beat him from time to time, which I always Very find rarely. hilarious. Very rarely. But Stroll's got a pole position in his career, so, you know. Well, so's Alonso, to be fair. Um, <laughs> he's got like, more than one. He's, he's only got about few. 20, hasn't he? He's, he's got, I think he's got 19. He's, he's got yeah. one of the highest percentage more wins to poles um, yeah. of someone that's got like more than 10 of each um, yeah. yeah but obviously yeah Albon made it through into Q2 so Logan Sargent's run of trying to beat him uh, and he ended up once again being Max ahead of Leclerc this time around Sainz um, ended up P3 ahead of Perez and then it was both McLarens both Mercedes Hulk and Yuki Tsunoda rounding out of the top 10 and then at the start of the race almost the funniest thing ever happened Oh, it would have been amazing. It would have been so funny. But Perez starting, what, P4, Four. Uh, had both Ferraris to try and overtake and went really, really narrow into turn one uh, on the dust and massive, massive lockup. So nearly took his teammate out and it would have been amazing because he would have got sacked there and then. <laughs> oh, absolutely. He wouldn't have been able to make it, but Red Bull would have already deactivated his pass. He they would have been uh, like back in the garage. Yeah. They would have sacked him by radio, I think. Um, we would have watched as Jos Verstappen and Helmut Marko literally beat him up at the side of the road. <laughs> yeah, but he got away with it. Perez saved Leclerc because Leclerc was getting rinsed by Sainz, but Sainz then had to take massive avoiding action uh, to avoid Perez. And then Leclerc was able to switch back and get back into P2. Uh, Oscar Piastri, great move running outside of the pair of them into kind of turn three and four, wasn't it? Um and yeah, took P3 uh, behind Leclerc briefly at the start. And he was really the hero of the first stint, really, wasn't he? He, he? The McLaren had really good pace. And Piastri overtook Leclerc once the DRS was active. And he was keeping Max honest. Max was only two or three seconds up the road. And that's, you know, that's usually eight seconds by about lap, lap five, isn't it? So Piastri was really doing bits in that first stint. Um and I felt, yeah, as the race went on, it, it kind of got away from him. But, yeah, it's just which was a massive shame because he, he was really doing well when the race was normal. Heavily underrated drive, I think, by Oscar Piastri. And this was kind of like the interesting thing, wasn't it, for McLaren this weekend, um, was obviously the fact that everyone obviously was struggling with surface temperatures on tyres. But because McLaren are really, really good at warming up their tyres, as we saw in Shanghai when Lando took pole in the sprint... Uh, it actually meant that they were able to keep the heat inside the tyre rather than on the surface. So they were able to work their tyres a little bit harder than everyone else and actually still able to find grip from it. Um, whereas, yeah, Ferrari really struggled with it. Obviously, Max really struggled with it before he then damaged his car as well a bit later on. So McLaren, I tell you what, if, if they can keep this performance going because they didn't think this was going to be a particularly strong weekend for the new upgrades, there's a chance. I want to hope. There won't be a chance, but I want to believe there could be. Not a championship. Oh, no. Putting that but out at there. least, you know, but, trying to make Red Bull work for it. Yeah, more race wins, I think. Spoiler, they won the race. If you, <laughs> if somehow you didn't know that prize, yeah. that would be staggered. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, early on, though, there, there was, it, was, it was kind of... I mean, we were starting to get a little bit nervous, weren't we, that it was kind of turning into a typical F1 2024 race, where there are battles going on. But none of them last for a particularly long time. I mean, we saw Lewis and George move past Hulkenberg after he had a decent start and got past the pair of them. Uh, and then it was kind of very quickly turning into just a race of who can keep their tyres. Mm. Yeah, you had the Ferraris kind of bottled up behind Piastri and then Norris kind of bottled up behind Perez uh, trying to come back from his, his P6 on the grid, I think. Or did he just get a bad start, wasn't it? Um, he had a bad start yeah, as well. Yeah, so eventually some drivers made the call to box. Uh, you had Leclerc was the first of the front runners to pit and undercut. Uh, Perez then pit shortly after, which released Norris, who was eight or nine seconds behind sides and just started reeling him in, which really showed how much life left he had in the tyres and the pace of the McLaren, really. He was closing up enormously on that little pack behind Piastri. Um, 
uh, yeah, they basically just ignored Leclerc and Perez and, and hoped uh, they could make the time back later. And to be fair, Perez got stuck behind the midfield. And never, like His pace just didn't really materialise at all, which I think we said quite a lot about Sergio Perez, to be honest. Um, but he, I think he came up behind Ocon and maybe Tsunoda, I think it was, uh, and basically just didn't really make progress. So he overtook Ocon eventually, but all that time Norris was lapping faster. So may have even overcut had he not had a safety car intervention. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you, you failed to mention one of the best bits about this period of the race there, Jamie, <laughs> um, was that once again, I mean, I, I'm going to say it for controversy's sake and not actually mean it with too much depth, but as soon as Max Verstappen is under pressure in a Grand Prix, he goes and pulls it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't call it pressure no, particularly, not, but not, I'm yes. Uh, he took out the bollard and then Lewis Hamilton was the first to complain about it because he loves, he loves a little moan on the radio, doesn't he? So, uh, hang, yeah, hang, he can... on, um, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Everyone <laughs> Hamilton, loves a good uh... moan on the radio. It's just that whoever's the world champion, their radios get repeated a lot more. We, we've Sorry, said been, it, though, haven't we, with Max three, as well? It's been four years since Hamilton won a world champion. No, I know, but we're basically just basing that off all those years <laughs> of hearing Hamilton moan. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah. we've said it more recently, haven't we? You, you get a lot more of Max now moaning on the radio as well. It's just what yeah. they do. Like, yeah, it's true. But it was amusing to me that Hamilton is unable to drive around the chicane without the help of a bollard. Uh, so maybe it was tactical from Max Verstappen. It was. He yeah. said he wanted he wanted to try and see what the front wing was like, everything like that. Um, but yeah, that bollard then obviously got kind of shifted around and ended up stranded on the racing line, um, which there were already calls for a safety car. By Fernando Alonso as well. By the drivers who hadn't pit yet, they wasn't exactly. a safety car. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I actually, um, I, you know, I, I think you were going to mention the fact they waited, like, way longer than they should have done to put that virtual safety car out. Yes. I like that because they were they were clever in that they waited until the, the lead pack had passed the pit lane so that it didn't ruin the race. I think that was quite clever from them because they basically, it was going to be a really short VSC, like, genuinely... 20 seconds so they just waited until nobody was near the pit lane apart from Esteban Ocon because obviously he gets lucky um, and yeah the VSC then didn't favour any of the, the main drivers which I thought was quite clever I think you're re- so the point of a VSC Jamie is what? question time well get rid of the, the damn it get rid of the debris on track and why do you want to get rib- rid of debris on the track? Because it's dangerous. <laughs> why are we talking about using a virtual safety car for entertainment purposes? Well, it's, it wasn't entertainment. It's actually to save... It's to not ruin the race. It wasn't a particularly dangerous thing. It just had to go. So, yeah. I I liked it. Let us know what you thought in the comments. I Yeah, I feel like you... I mean, we've already seen it before, haven't we? Where Formula 1 is... I mean, Mugello 2020 is always our throwback to this. Um, that maybe just maybe they're, they're starting to try and use these kind of things for the entertainment rather than just actually what they're intended for, which is not a good look. Um, shout but if they wanted to use it for entertainment, they they would have waited until Verstappen had passed the pits and then thrown it out so everyone else could have gained advantage. But they were actually yeah, quite fair with it. Then Max would cry about it on radio and all this, that, and the other. Yeah, that's um, great, great <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> um, but yeah, a few laps later, though, Carlos Sainz, Oscar Piastri. Uh, finally dive into the pit lane pretty much at the same time as Kevin Magnussen and Logan Sargent come to blows. Now, I'm hoping this was the incident you were talking about earlier mm, with Kevin Magnussen. It was. I genuinely don't get how this is his fault. It really isn't his fault. It's simply because he's Kevin Magnussen. I'm exactly. convinced. Exactly. If these, genuinely, if these drivers were swapped around, okay, you got him. Magnussen's going for a switchback and he exited turn one. He is easily alongside enough to warrant space his left front is like in the middle of sergeant's side pod he's easily alongside enough to deserve some space sergeant to be fair to him is just unaware he's not trying to be dangerous he just doesn't know that magnus is there but that's his fault yeah and he t- he turns across him they crash out sergeant's out the race uh crying about biting his tongue or something on the radio but you know didn't ask uh, well, but so... i can work out because he said he <laughs> bit something but it was beeped out so I can work. I mean, it must oh, have been I his think tongue. he let go of the radio. It must be his tongue or his cheek or something. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but he's fine. Uh, and Magnussen gets the penalty for being alongside and getting turned in on. Which I mean, yeah. If you swap these drivers around, if Magnussen is in Sergeant's car and Sergeant is in Magnussen's position, he's Magnussen getting the still gets the penalty. Still. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, how many times are we going to beat this drum? 
the to fit the the best thing Formula One. If, if Formula One could add one rule right now, it would be if your front wheels are alongside the rear wheels of the car in front, they have to give you a car's width space. Bring back real wheel to wheel racing <laughs> and make the car smaller, so that's possible at Monaco, for instance. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I just don't get how being a Formula One steward is a part time job. Still, that's just it's insane bizarre, to me. isn't it? The, the idea and it that changes every it race changes on a dime is just yeah. so weird. So weird. Um, I think they should make us the stewards. I think we would do a better job. I think we do a great job. So, yeah. There you go, Formula One. Bring us in. We'll be we'll be your stewarded body for the future. We'll we'll t- I've or- I already take the abuse on Twitter from the Spaniards anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm quite happy to, to let that one continue. step ahead. Exactly, exactly. Um, then then some controversy stepped in, despite the fact that Magnussen got a penalty for a crash that we don't think is his fault, um, because Lando Norris was really the only driver that hadn't pit yet, uh, and the safety car then picked up Max Verstappen in P two. Yes. <laughs> It wasn't that controversial in the end because no. Norris would have been leading had the safety car done its job properly anyway. This is what I was going to say. People are going, oh, well, Lando was gifted the win because Max would have been ahead of him. No. I don't actually think he would have been. I think Lando <laughs> no. had the gap anyway. Yes, he did. Uh, but it was amusing because it's we've seen this glitch on, on Codemasters F1 games back in the day and the car leading just gets disqualified for not being in the queue. <laughs> so I'm glad that didn't happen. Uh, but it basically briefly looked like Norris might have a lap lead uh, but eventually the safety car did realise who the leader really was and let well, everyone back yeah. through it made me laugh because you saw a load of people crying about it on Twitter going Lando's going to have a lap advantage do you honestly think the FIA would allow yeah. that to happen <laughs> that Lando Norris happen. wins the race by a lap <laughs> yeah that was never going to happen at all so yes uh, Lando was in the lead and he would have been in the lead had the safety car done its job properly anyway um with fresh tires. And from this point from this point on, having seen the McLaren's uh you know, pace with Piastri and Norris in the first stint, I fully convinced myself he was going to win. Because he had five lap fresher tires than Verstappen and track position at a track which is quite hard to overtake. So I at this point in the race I I knew that Norris was gonna win. I'm not well, saying I, that because I was proven right. Say so I put out a tweet about this at the time. Uh, let me just see. Here we go. So I said, I think as the safety car was about to come in, I said, Lando could win this race. He won't. He will let Max by with zero fight. Age like milk, but it's staying on my Twitter. Why? Um, I thought you tweeted that to try and, like, anti-jinx it. No. You actually believe when that? Have, when have you ever seen... This is the first time ever I think I've seen Lando defend from Max ever in a race. Yeah, because in every other race, he's not fighting for the win with Max, whereas but this time he was. No, he he's not? You've got because to go for it sometimes. It's about lap three, usually, when they're fighting, and the Red Bull's but clearly the faster car. My logic is with this kind of thing, as always. If I, if Genuinely, if I was in a Formula 1 driver and I had enough skill, which I don't, um, I would be still fighting Max on every situation... For the idea that in the future, if I've got a car that can fight for a championship, immediately he's a little bit more nervous about me. Mm. I think Norris is usually thinking about his overall race time. And usually he's fighting other people. So losing time against Verstappen is just going to cost him positions later on with the drivers he is fighting. So, yeah. yeah. I think he races with his head. And obviously as as, as soon as Verstappen is fighting for a race win with him, he did defend it properly. He almost messed it up, but he, he did. did defend it properly. <laughs> he did, yeah. It was, it was quite a bit nip and tuck. Uh, did you see the interview that Juan Pablo Montoya did recently with Tom Clarkson? No, I didn't. Um, obviously saying about him fighting with Michael Schumacher. I, I, This is why Juan Pablo Montoya is genuinely, I think, one of the most underrated drivers of all time. Because he basically said, obviously, when he came into Formula 1 with Williams, what annoyed him more than anything else was the fact no one would fight Michael on the track. So he basically mm. just decided he would at every single occasion, whether it made sense or not. And that yes. obviously worked out pretty well in just his second ever Grand Prix when he made a new <laughs> one. Um, yeah. But that, that's what we need from more Formula 1 drivers. Is I feel like if Magnussen drove a Ferrari, sense. that would be class. If Magnussen drove a Ferrari, I think every Italian would have a heart attack. Um, but but <laughs> yes. I would love to... Well, I mean, we saw it last year, didn't we? Uh, last year or 20... It must, yeah, it was last year, wasn't it? In Singapore when Max and K-Mag actually went wheel-to-wheel. And yeah. funnily enough, it didn't work out very well for Max Verstappen. 
<laughs> well, yeah. But then it doesn't work out very well for most drivers who go up against Magnussen. So, yeah, can cut him some slack on that. Exactly. He's, he's, he's a beautiful man who occasionally, I think, now is probably screwed over by the FIA. However, uh, because he's close to getting a race ban, he's no longer getting points on his license, uh, which oh, I always think yeah. is quite points funny. Points on the license is the most pointless thing in the world, ironically, because as soon as anyone gets near 12 points in a year, they just stop giving penalty points because they can't be bothered to ban anyone. So, exactly. unless it's actually I mean, who's, something who's independent. Was it George Russell? I think Grosjean was on 11. Grosjean, but Grosjean did get a race ban before No, that no, as this well. is recently. Like, oh, Grosjean yeah, in 2018, yeah, yeah. I think, was on 11. Yeah. And he had an incident that was definitely a penalty point and they didn't give it. No. Same with Gasly, who was on 11 briefly last year. He was, somehow. wasn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, they're just complete bottle jobs at the FAA. We all know this by now. We should, again, be in charge. <laughs> we would make it yes. better. Um, uh, yeah, it was kind of one of those weird ones, wasn't it? Where the second half of the race was after the safety car was actually fairly... I mean, again, it was a bit like a standard F1 2024 race, wasn't it? There were there were battles going on, but not many of them were particularly dramatic. But it was saved by the fact that it wasn't Max Verstappen at the front of the field. Yeah, we had um, a different we, car, five seconds clear. So exactly. we all forget it. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think the last kind of major incident, we, we never really got any footage of it, so we can't really still tell. Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon had a mad battle, apparently, uh, but we don't really know. Um, and yes. then also Sainz and Piastri, um, in which people were crying that Sainz got a penalty for the fact that he took Oscar out. Yeah, although I see Sainz's point with the first time around, because he was forced off the track by Piastri at turn 11. Max Verstappen um, rule, it's allowed. It is allowed, but it's stupid. So I oh, feel exactly. for Sainz. I, I get that, but it is the wrong <laughs> I don't want to just thing. sound like a, a broken record. It was, it like, the FIA are not going to penalise that because no. Piastri was ahead and he ran him out of road. So that, that happens. But I did feel for Sainz. But then Sainz's move into the second last corner or, like, the final breaking zone um, was over the limit and he broke Piastri's front wing, which spent an end to Piastri's race, which I've, you know, Piastri drove really really well all, all race so i felt bad because yeah he was then last um and came back to what, what about p14 or something wasn't it so uh yeah science got a penalty fully deserved uh but i did also feel that piastri should have given more space but then why would he because the rules are stupid exactly exactly i mean i think the the thing was obviously people go well, what's the difference the the problem was obviously if science hadn't have locked up his rears yeah then he probably would have got away with it but the yeah. fact that he wasn't under complete control of the car um is what makes that one a penalty shout out to i think it was nelson pk wasn't it at the 1986 hungarian grand prix oh yeah um but <laughs> For like yeah. drifting past someone at turn one quality drifting around the outside of center at yeah. one madness um but yeah i again as we said earlier on if the car has got their front wheels alongside your rear wheels, you should have to give them space. Yes. Yes, it That's... gets blurred when you're going around a corner because at some point their wheels will no longer be alongside and you technically can run them out of road. Well, they're not there anymore, so you're not running them out of road. Well, if they are still there, <laughs> if, if, if they are still there, then you shouldn't be running them out of road, uh, is, yeah. is what I think. Basically, cars shouldn't be in a position where they can force each other off the circuit. Yeah, be nice to each other. But that's going to work, isn't it? Never. So. <laughs> Never in a million years. And like we said, it's it's ruined Formula 1 for the best part of a decade now, and it will continue to ruin Formula 1 for the best part of another decade, which is a shame, but we digress. Yeah, I do think it's happened. Yeah, I remember Magni... Well, I don't remember, but I've seen videos of Magni Court 03? 02? 01, maybe? I don't With, know uh, what you're referencing. When, uh, when DC was trying to run the outside of Schumacher at the hairpin. Hmm. Uh, and then he, he waved his middle finger at him for telling him he wants to be P1 exactly. uh, <laughs> and Schumacher ran him out of road then and got away with it but it, it's obviously, it's rude but it's not, it's never really been black and white against the rules so Should it it's be? kind of one of them Should it be? I would like to see what would happen if it was I feel like it would almost make it easier to go around the outside than to go down the inside because you could just get your car alongside and then they've got to give you the space but then maybe that's how it should be i don't know i would I like to see it, a, an experiment this is the thing isn't it because at the end of the day one of the reasons why we've moaned that f1 is still quite boring at the moment is you know yes the cars can overtake each other but all they do is sit behind each other through the corners and then just go for a move down a drs zone but that's kind of how it's always been. You always pass on the straights. Well, it hasn't. DRS has only been around for 10 years. No, just but the, the 
before DRS, we didn't have any overtakes at all. So well, <laughs> the yeah. overtakes were done in the pit lane. Yeah, it's it just feels yeah like that's a potential to help fix everything mm. that's going on at the moment. Um, but it would be Lando Norris finally taking his first ever Formula One Grand Prix victory. Shout out to Nick Heidfeld. You're back at the top of the record books. Yes. We love you. One week um, after I said he would be at some point, you were like, will he? Will yeah. he? Will Norris ever yeah. win a race? Yeah. And then here we are. <laughs> here we are a week later and Lando Norris is a Formula One race winner. Uh, Verstappen P2 in the end had a Leclerc. So three cars, three different teams on the podium. Pretty good going. Yeah. Uh, Sainz would finish P4, but that penalty would drop in between Perez and Lewis. Uh, with Sonoda despite having a worst best result picking up more points than Ricardo this weekend which I yeah. think is just quite funny uh, beating out Russell Alonso finished P9 and yeah, Esteban Ocon picking up the final point now means Sonoda is ahead of Stroll in the championship which yeah, I think is which incredible is quality. and after I think it was Saudi Arabia did you say on podcast that none of those bottom none of the back markers would beat Ben would... Yeah, I, I could see none... it happening <laughs> But so what's known as the head, Hulk is level. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo's one point behind. Is he? Yeah. Well, he got five points in the in the sprint race alone, didn't he? Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose, didn't he? For some reason, so, I thought that it was only like three. No, it was quite a lot. But yeah, it looks like all, I would say all of the backmarkers will score points in the team championship. No. And I think most of them. Oh, sorry, team's will, championship, sorry. Team's yeah. championship will score points. I think most of them will beat Behrman. No. There'll be some ridiculous race. There'll be a race where Gasly finishes P5. I don't see a world. I reckon both Alpines will do it, simply because the car is getting better now. Uh, shout out to Esteban Ocon, first Alpine points of the year. I don't see a world in which Joe or Sargent outscores I him. think Albon will. I'd, I'd be surprised I, if Albon I will, feel like will. Albon will get close, but I don't think he will by the end of the year, because that Williams just isn't that good. Uh, and I feel like Bottas will struggle as well, because again, similar situation to the Williams. The car's terrible. So, yeah, I, I feel like one yeah. of them will, one of them won't, simply just for an eggy result somewhere. Yes, potentially. Uh, but yeah, that that spell and end to the race. Uh, Lando Norris's radio, very very sweet. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Um, mm. But what, yeah. what we've learned this weekend is the only way to win a Grand Prix this year is to lose body parts. Because of course, yeah. before the weekend, Lando Norris had damaged his nose, hadn't he, partying in the Netherlands. Uh, and obviously Sainz had his appendix removed earlier on in the year. But and, uh, wait, who am I thinking? No, that was last year, wasn't it? Um, yeah, and Norris was in a fight, so all of his first ever winning fight. photo. What? What was it? He just uh, bashed his head on some glass. Oh, it looked like he was he in a fight. <coughs> no, he wasn't in a fight. Or Lando Norris would not end up in a fight. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's all his, his forever immortalized his first photos of winning a race is going to have a little stupid plaster on his nose yep. so, <laughs> that's a shame but you know i think he'll get over it uh oh, time for your quiz oh no La- lando norris is oh, obviously no. now a race winner yeah uh winning one grand prix yeah in his career okay since the beginning of the 1980 four to one season uh because we're ignoring all the stupid indy 500 winners there okay. are 11 drivers who have won exactly one Grand Prix. Oh, no. You, ha- I think I've done this quiz before, maybe two years ago or something. You've got a minute. Go. Lando Norris, George yes. Russell, Esteban yes. Ocon, Pierre Gasly, Pastor Maldonado. Yes. Uh, Heike Kovalainen, That's... welcome to the world of winning. Yes. And uh, goodbye from it. Robert Kubica as well, obviously won the yes. race same season. Uh, Doing well. Um, Trying to think, Yano Trulli, Monaco. Yes, that was his only ever win. Um, Timo Glock never won a race, did he? Nope. Um, Fisichella won more than one race. Yes. Uh, Olivier Panis, obviously yes. he won Monaco as well. Uh, when was it from? Sorry, nineteen. Nineteen eighty. Jean Alesi, he only yes. won one race. How many more have I got? One more, one more. Um, oh, I was. You got I've, thirteen seconds. It was Japan, wasn't it? It's an iconic race. It is. It's, yeah, when Senna and Prost came together. The five seconds. Are you Alessandro get it? Nanini. There you go. Bang! Well done. <laughs> yeah, his one and only race win. Suzuka 89, wasn't it? Jamie. Yeah? 
I had a feeling you'd ask me that quiz. Oh, you're a snake. <laughs> the man's done his research. <laughs> Did you have it up on your second screen? I might have done. You're an absolute rat. Right. <laughs> Well, that yeah, was I was like, oh, I got a quiz for him. I know exactly what he's going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Oh, man. So funny. So funny. Well, everyone tell Matt he's a rat in the comments. Please do. Yeah, exactly. I, I, <laughs> especially if you're Spanish. Bring it yeah, on. if you want to do it in Spanish, call him a raton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was just when you said to me pre show, I was like, I'm just going to fire up the list of one time yeah. Grand Prix. I think you'd have got most of them anyway. I feel like, yeah, I, I probably would have. If you give me 90 seconds, I would have got there with most of them, but a couple of them I would have choked, I feel. Um, Maybe. Just because I would have thought there was more in the early 80s. The fact that there was no one-time None. winners between yeah. 1977 and 1989 is madness. Absolutely madness. But I, I do there also love the fact that basically every Indianapolis winner, uh, with the exception the of 53 and 54... Um, never won another Grand Prix, which to be well, fair, might well have been the same one, driver. Really, didn't they? Exactly, might well have been the same driver that yeah. won fifty three and fifty four. Um, I mean, that's mad, isn't it? <laughs> Just some of those random ones that have got a Formula One win and probably never cared. Um, yeah. Race rating, then, Jamie. I want to compare what I said for other races. I think, I think I, we've, we've basically... given pretty much every single one a six and a half so far. Yeah, they're on the spectrum of five and a half to six and a half basically yeah. so th- this one was the best I would say of the season yeah but it wasn't you know it wasn't an absolute barnstormer so I'll what go a it, seven and has, a half I was going to say seven and a half as well what it has done is saved the Miami Grand Prix because yeah, let's be I don't fair think... we all thought he was should be dropped um, but now it, it's the first time we've actually had a decent ish race there and actually, well, for the second time in three years, Lando Norris has been the one that made it interesting, hasn't he? Yeah, because he caused a safety car with Gasly, didn't he, a couple of years ago? Yeah. Um, was that only one one year ago when they were terrible? And shout out to McLaren's 2022. Advanced, like how how much better they're getting? Because a year ago they finished seventeenth in this race on pace. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy progress. Madness, absolute madness, isn't it? And people saying that, oh, it's the budget cap that's done that. No, I think it's just generally a bit of fluke, and the fact that McLaren have actually got some really clever people behind the scenes. Yeah, Andrea Andreas Stella, Stella knows what he's doing. He's a very intelligent man. Yes, indeed he is. Uh, Driver drive of the, the day. day. Got to be Lando, hasn't it? Really? I mean, you can't really probably say anyone else sensibly. Probably. Shout um, out to uh, shout out to Valtteri Bottas, who was briefly second on the vote. On the... <laughs> I was, that might I could not work out why. Yeah, what, I didn't know why at all. Done? Well, he's done nothing. He lost to Joe, so that says it all. Yeah, a bit, a bit disappointing there um, for him. But um, prediction-wise, I thought I'd had a stinker this week, uh, but looking back, we actually did okay. Yeah, because for some reason I said Sergio Perez would win the sprint race, uh, which never looked likely. <laughs> so yeah, that gave you. Well, I said Perez sprint. Max Pole. Two points. And then two points there. I, I'm very pleased with myself, but it doesn't actually mean very much because I put Max, Leclerc, Norris as a top three, which is correct, but in the wrong order. So I got one point each uh, because it was obviously Norris, Max, Leclerc, and that gives me five points overall. And I said Max for the sprint win, so two points. I said Max for Pole, so another two points. And I said Max to win, so I get one point there, and then I... Oh, excuse me, said Perez and Sainz. Uh, so, just by predicting Max Verstappen domination, I managed to equally... You got five it. points. I yes. wonder whether... Because, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, but we, we said this pre-show. Usually, that is the kind of eggy result you would have to <laughs> equal me, not vice versa. In the future, I'm not saying this year, but 2025, do we say two points for sprint and pole... And then three points if you get it right, and two points if you get it one out. Uh, I'd have to work out if that's good or if that makes a difference or not. But we could talk about it. It would make a difference, <laughs> especially this weekend, because actually, would it? So I'd get six points. You would get uh, eight. Ah, well, we should It'd definitely be... do it then. <laughs> Just this weekend <laughs> only. Yes. No, we, I we will talk about it. I don't know. Predictions are a bit of fun. Uh, they are but, just meant to be a bit of fun. I, I was thinking yeah. about I had some nostalgia yesterday. I don't even really know why. Um, but that we used to do F1 Fantasy. 
Whatever happened to yeah. them? Is it, is it still terrible? I never even downloaded it's terrible. it this year. They, they've overcomplicated it hugely because there's basically, you can make unlimited transfers basically every week and there's so many chips that don't really make any sense. And it's obvious who you should get because the pricing's all wrong. They never update so, the pricing at all. Yeah, so it's yeah. pretty, pretty shocking. Fantasy football is much better and I'm currently 12,000th wish... in the world. I so. wish they'd done something proper like FPL with it because it had so much potential, didn't it? Yes, FPL has t- uh, 11 million players. I reckon F1. I mean, actually, I'll have a quick look. F1 Fantasy 2024. 11 million players. I'm currently with two weeks to go, 12,000th in the world. Wow. Wow. Everyone say well uh, done to me. Exactly. Shout out to J183. <laughs> Let me have a look. How many people are playing F1 Fantasy in 2024? Did I Probably ever a... even set up a team? I want. I wonder if it, I probably guess it's around a hundred k. I mean, the problem like, is, of course, is there's still a lot of people that will sign up and then never do anything with it. Yeah. Um. How can I just do public leagues? Classic public. Um. Oh, there's just a load of random sponsored ones. That's I have no idea. Do they not do a real one anymore? There's some random choices for people that have got like a proper league. That's quite Who knows? Surprising. Uh, is it just like an F1 league? F1? They'll be, they'll be even... global, won't they? You'd think so. I mean, sure. not? I mean have, they, have they given up with it that much that there's not even a global <laughs> league anymore? I've no idea. I don't know. Anyway, most, but it's most a rubbish of like, game. the big, yeah, most of the popular started ones have only got 1,000, 100,000 people, which is quite disappointing, to be honest. It had so much potential, but they've ruined it, which is a shame. We, we've already rambled on towards the end there. Um, but thank you all. Have we got anything else to add, Jamie, before we head to Imola? Uh, well, we head to, I'm going I'm going properly to Imola. So that's You're going fun. to Imola. I'm at Belgium this weekend for the World Endurance Race, which I'm very much Lovely. looking forward to. Uh, um, yeah, so we'll do the Imola preview uh, before I get on the plane. And wonderful. What day are you flying in? Tuesday evening. Oh, so well, long I in hate. advance. Got a long. I got a week in. Well, for a couple of days in Bologna to kill. So nice, nice. Yeah, gonna okay, be lovely. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, enjoy that, sir. Thank you all so much as always for listening. If you have enjoyed, please do make sure you leave a like. Get yourself subscribed. Uh, and yeah, we'll be back next week then, ready to preview the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix.